Okay. So we'll just get started with the retina and, and systemic inherited diseases. Um, there's another version of this, like on the Moran core um, that I gave in person um, a couple of years ago. Um, but I kind of, I wasn't that happy with it. I kind of felt like it was like the Cirque Traverse at Snowbird. So a little bit like too intense. Um, so I tried to turn this from a black diamond into a blue square, more like the loop and loop in Mineral Basin, where you can just like look down at the black diamonds, but you don't have to go down anything really scary. So hopefully that'll, that'll help because I think you just can't learn it all at once. So it's better to just start from the high yield stuff. Um, the stuff that really sticks out that would come up on a test question or in real life. Um, so if you guys like see something like, oh, I saw this on a test, but it's not in your lecture, let me know because that might be something to add in here. Um, so I just uh, talk about how not to memorize things because when you look at this table from your BCSC um, on the left here, it's like incredibly uh, overwhelming. It's just like trying to remember the names of, or rec learning how to recognize all the little brown birds if you're a birder. Um, it's not a good way to learn anything. So the best way to uh, learn things is to try to uh, group things in uh, three to five, um, try to do repetition with increasing intervals and try to um, explain why things happen. So humans can remember like three to four things uh, that's why, you know, a phone number has things grouped into like three and four digits. Uh, unfortunately, primary children slash IHC did not recognize this human limitation, and they made their FIN numbers have however many digits that is all at once not broken up. So every time I have to read the FIN number out loud for a timeout, I get kind of stressed. <laughs> um, another principle for um, how to um, memorize things is to gradually increase the intervals. So at first you might only be able to remember it for a day, but after a couple of repetitions, maybe you can remember it for two days, then a week, then month. And that's how you kind of get things into your long-term memory. Um, I have this picture of a dog here because this is how I taught my dog to remember that vacuum cleaners don't kill you uh, by gradually uh, increasing the interval between vacuuming. And uh, humans remember stories. So you remember uh, the Lorax um, really well and that kind of, you know, the emotions of the story and the characters a lot better than if you were to read, you know, an article about how many acres of coniferous forests were eliminated, et cetera. So trying to make a story, whether it's a patient's story or the story of how the body works and why, um, I think will really help you memorize these like really high yield things that come up on tests because they affect the eyes and the rest of the body. So uh, we're just gonna do like four different like phenotypes. So four different categories of how the eyes or the, how the retinas look. Um, one is a retinal degeneration. Another is fu fundus hypopigmentation. Um, another is a cherry red spot or vessel tortuosity. I kind of group those together. And the uh, last is myopia combined with retinal detachment. So I'll start off with a case. This is a patient that I saw recently, an eight-year-old developmentally delayed female. Um, she's had nystagmus since she was little. Um, they got a brain MRI to work her up when she was a couple months old. That was normal. And, um, but she's really had a lot of trouble seeing in the dark. And now, you know, she just can't uh, see if there's a night light on. She needs to have all the lights on. And recently, she's also been feeling her way down the stairs and running into things. Her mom thinks that this could be, you know, due to her vision. And her medical history, she's also uh, congenitally deaf, uh, but she can uh, hear some with hearing aids, but she speaks sign language. And she also had a history of hypotonia from when she was little, and she has developmental delay globally. Um, the mom said, I knew something was wrong at six months when she wouldn't sit up, but the pediatrician ignored me. I keep bringing her to all these doctors, but no one will tell me what, what is wrong. Like there are all these things wrong with her, uh, but no one's put the picture together. So I asked her if she'd ever had genetic testing and she said no. So, but anyway, the reasons for that uh, we could get into later. 
All right. And uh, this is her uh, fundus photos. Um, I'm going to start calling on you guys, okay, in rotating order. Um, George, uh, what's abnormal quickly about the fundus photos um, in the upper part? So <clears throat> in the fundus photos, I just see some speculated like bony uh, lesions, like especially in the periphery. Yeah, there are bone spicules in here, those black things. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. And then there's also some sort of lesion over the macula itself. Um, yeah, it looks like a fairly like well demarcated area of RPE atrophy. That's mm -hmm. kind of like because this part is like paler than the rest. Um, and then uh, is this OCT normal? <laughs> uh. No, I would say it's not. Um, seems like overall pretty atrophic, and especially like in the um, in the uh, RPE uh, sort of. I yeah. don't. I can't really distinguish like outer retinal layers at all. Yeah, normally we have like the RPE and Brooks memory kind of right next to each other, and I think here there's still a little RPE left, but here. It's totally, the RP is gone, but Brooks membrane is still there. And we definitely don't see that, you know, we normally see that ISOS junction, a, a third line, you know, above the um, RP Brooks. Um, and then the other clue that things are atrophic, like you said, like thinned, and is that uh, there's a lot of hypertransmission. So we're just seeing the choroid brighter than normal, especially in the middle where there's this atrophic lesion. Um, and the optic nerves are elevated. Um, I frequently see this in people with inherited retina conditions. I don't know if it's like a known thing. Maybe a pediatric neuroophthalmologist could tell me sometime. Um, and then this is her uh, flicker. So uh, basically it's a measure of cone function because you're um, stimulating the uh, retina with bright flashes that are happening so quickly that the Cones have time to recover, but the rods don't have time to recover. And the amplitude is just really small. So overall, um, it looks like in her center macula, things are not good. And that's where most of the cones are. And then this uh, flicker is also indicating there's a problem with the cones. But these bone spickles out in the periphery where most of the rods are, and the fact that she can't see at night um, indicate uh, that uh, she has a rod problem. So, because rods help you with uh, vision in the dark. So, what to do next? Um, George, what do you think we should do? Um, genetic testing. Um, yeah, for genetic our, testing. Our, RP or, or RP related sort of syndromes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so as you mentioned, uh, RP or RP related syndromes, because some of them can affect things like not only causing a retinitis pigmentosa, like uh, appearance in the eyes, but they can affect hearing and development uh, like she has. So that's our next um, phenotype. So um, some gross generalizations about the um, things that cause uh, retinal degeneration and systemic problems um, is that they're almost always recessive because they tend to be like really pretty bad. So um, they wouldn't be passed down in an autosomal dominant fashion because many times like people uh, don't make it to the age of reproducing because of all their health problems. Um, the other explanation for why they're um, often recessive is that many times these are um, mutations in the proteins that are enzymes. So they're breaking things down. And a lot of times for enzymes, you just need a small amount of that enzyme to catalyze you know, thousands of reactions. So usually having half of the amount of enzymes because you've got like a dominant mutation with one good, one bad copy, one good copy, uh, usually that wouldn't cause disease. You'd have to have like no enzyme at all. Um, and then the, the other gross generalization is that most of these diseases have uh, severe neurological problems, whether it's like on the developmental delay spectrum or they can even cause like progressive degeneration um, and death where, you know, kids like lose their ability to walk, talk, swallow, et cetera. So I like to categorize these by like what causes them and by the uh, critical like organelles um, in the, uh, in the um, 
photoreceptors. So this is the picture here. Um, what do you think are some categories of diseases by organelle? Can you, uh, let's see, let's call on, um, is it okay to call on the med students? <laughs> Nana, what do you think? Do you think this is an event student appropriate question? Where are you, Nana? Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Chase is okay. nodding. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, so, no. Ivan, I know this is like a really rough drawing, but what do you think um, this, like, uh, where I drew this little blue guy with all the stripes inside? What do you think, I, Organelle? I was trying to illustrate by that. Yeah, I'm not really sure, but I'm going to okay. guess mitochondria, maybe. Oh, like, mitochondria, uh, yes. Okay, you've interpreted <laughs> my, my uh, drawing correctly. And then, um, Brianna, the, uh, the green and the orange are like little round organelles that like degrade things. Um, are those you... li lysosomes? Yeah, one of them is lysosomes, very good. And then um, the other um, critical organelle is like the cilia, which um, is the, uh, the, is this the outer segment? <laughs> the outer yes. segment of the photoreceptors um, actually are a modified uh, cilium. You know, normally cilia like are move around and like help things like swim along or move along in the body. But the, I think just maybe how they evolved, they were, um, Cilia. And then the other thing that degrades things is peroxisomes. Uh, so we have cilia, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and mitochondria. So the lysosomal conditions are called lysosomal storage disorders, and then the peroxisome disorders are called peroxisome biogenesis disorders. Okay, excellent. Oh, <laughs> forgive my mess ups in my animation. So th these are uh, the ciliopathies um, are sometimes called like uh, retinal blank disorders because they frequently affect like what other organ of the body? Uh, anyone? <laughs> ear canal, inner ear canal? Uh, say that again? <laughs> I'm guessing. An in, in, inner ear canal, like the, the cilia in the inner ear, I don't know. Oh, uh, they do, um, you know, uh, some of them do affect hearing. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, they also affect uh, the uh, kidneys. I'm not sure where, but are there cilias in the kidneys? But anyway, <laughs> if anyone knows, feel free to shout it out. Um, so, and they cause like kidney cysts or uh, nephronotysis, which is kind of like, you know how there's like eye tysis where the eye shrinks and turns white. It's just where the kidneys shrink and uh okay so and get scarred i guess nana is a uh, not able is to my audio work? and not that can well in that like when you i can hear you oh. but then when you talk i can't really like understand what you're saying so weird sorry <laughs> it's okay it's all good okay um so can you guys name some ciliopathies that affect that cause like a retinitis pigmentosa kind of phenotype i i accidentally left a clue here of a brain picture where the brain stem looks like a molar tooth uh <laughs> I <see>. thankfully <laughs> okay oh okay nana's coming uh saving the day with his uh mnemonics so Jabs, Ju Jubert, Alstrom, Bartit, Beetle, and Senior Loken. Very good. Excellent. Thanks, Nana. Um, so, uh, all right. So I put just three of those on here, thinking that maybe these are like the most high yield ones for you to memorize, like Usher syndrome. Uh, like George said, there's uh, cilia in the inner ear. So that causes like hearing loss and uh retinitis pigmentosa, it doesn't usually affect like other uh, parts of the body. And then uh, Joubert syndrome, that's where you look at this brain stem and it looks like a molar tooth. They also tend to uh, sometimes have ocular colobomas. And then the classic thing with Bardet beetle is an obese kid with polydactyly. So these are the ones that really like stuck out in my mind as like maybe the most easy to remember slash most testable. Nana's sharing more. 
oh, Usher syndrome and ciliopathies have been classified separately in the BCSC. So they're saying that Usher is not a ciliopathy. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for keeping us uh, straight, Nana. Appreciate that. Okay, so uh, lysosomal storage disorder. So as we mentioned, lysosomes degrade things. So when you don't degrade things, things build up inside the cells and then they start all that trash building up inside the cells make this kind of toxic. So um, what are some lysosomal storage disorders that cause like a retinitis pigmentosa type of uh, issue? Uh, okay. Nana says Fabry question mark. So Fabry is a lysosomal storage disorder that does affect the retina. But uh, interestingly, some of the lysosomal storage disorders cause um, like a retinitis pigmentosa type of phenotype, and then others cause like a cherry red spot and you know vascular tortuosity. I'm sure some researcher could explain to you why, or someone with a deeper biochemical understanding could explain to you why. But um, so the ones that uh, cause a retinitis pigmentosa-like phenotype are the neuronal ceroid lipofusinoses. Um, it's also called Batten disease and also the mucopolysaccharidoses. So Hunter, Hurler, Shea, and Sanfilippo. So all these cause like retinitis pigmentosa. So I think hopefully, uh, Brianna, um, do you know what the inheritance of Hunter disease is? Hunter syndrome. I definitely used to, uh, but I don't. I can't recall now. <laughs> it's okay, Ivan. X-linked. Okay, yeah. So X-linked because they have this like mnemonic where, like, it's like the hunter drawing the bow or something. So, uh, I, um, what do you think uh, the rest of these are, uh, Brianna? What inheritance do you think they are? If we're going for a pattern, are they all X-linked? Uh, they're uh, mostly autosomal recessive. So okay. Hunter is the one that like stands out. Uh, they tend to like pick the ones that like stand out to be on tests. So like whatever's different, um, they tend to like test that more. And the way it might come up on a test might be kind of tricky. Like they might say, oh, this got like passed down through the, the patient's like you know, only passes, it's only passed on through the woman in the family and only men get it, you know, so that might be like a way that it might show up on the test. So uh, the rest are autosomal recessive because they tend to be like severe enough, especially like Shea and Hurler and uh, neuronal steroid lipofusinosis that like people might die before they can reproduce or at least be severely disabled by that time in their life. So, um, and the uh, obviously the things that are building up are the, oh, I have a typo here, but the mucopolysaccharidoses, glycosaminoglycans are building up those large carbohydrate sugars. And then the uh, steroid, uh, something or another, <laughs> I don't know. Ly lipofusion, I guess, is like, you know, a buildup of, you know, lipid crash. So that is what's building up in Batten disease. So um, what are some, I think we talked about like the neurodegeneration and death that can occur with these diseases. Um, uh, what are some other like ocular things that can come up with the mucopolysaccharidosis? Anybody? Okay, corneal haze, very good. And uh, so the front of the eye can be affected by corneal haze as well as glaucoma, especially in Hurler or Shea. How about like in the back of the eye? Uh, uh, it doesn't cause um, cataracts. I haven't heard of it causing I, nystagmus. I guess it would depend how early in life it started, but uh, it causes optic atrophy uh, or edema. So that's the key thing to remember. And then how about the rest of the body for the uh, mucopolysaccharidoses? Um, don't try to talk, Nana. <laughs> it's not working. 
maybe get closer to your mic when you're done eating. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the um the key things like about like Hunter, Hurler, Shea, San Filippo is that those like carbohydrates, those like glycosaminoglycans, large negatively charged um uh long chains of carbohydrates are like uh, building up in the face so they cause coarse spaces and then they also build up like in the liver and the spleen cause hepatal splenomegaly okay excellent you guys have been really great about participating thank you and they can also just cause like developmental delay so it might not necessarily be uh on the on the milder spectrum you know they can just be developmentally delayed and have like a normal lifespan and not get progressively worse and, and die so Okay, so then uh, there's peroxisomes, um, and they tend to be problems with the peroxisomes forming. Um, that's what biogenesis means. And the peroxisomes uh, degrade lipids, although the lysosomes degrade lipids and many other things. Peroxisomes are like specific to degrading lipids. Anyone name any peroxisome biogenesis disorders? Okay, very good, very good. So Zellweger and neonatal, neonatal adrenal leukodystrophy, REFSM, thanks Nana for um, uh, filling that out. So um, there's kind of like, they're not all referred to the, as the Zellweger spectrum disorders. There's just a recognition that these are caused by mutations in the same gene and that there's just a, like a, a range of how they present. Um, and uh, there's generally speaking, either developmental delay or neurodegeneration death and uh, increased fatty acids in the blood um, because the uh, body's not degrading it. And there's also like adult Refsum disease, which is not as severe. Um, and uh, what's the one characteristic finding of that? Um, it's uh, ichthyosis. So like a scaly dry skin. So, uh, Chase, do you have a guess for like what's the inheritance of the Zellweger spectrum disorders? I feel like, I don't know. Well, I mean, if they're all grouped together, I feel like uh, the adrenal leukodystrophy was X-linked. Uh, they're actually, uh, they're actually autosomal recessive. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Cause, um. Anyway, that's the best. <laughs> Whenever you're not sure, go with go with autosomal recessive for these like things that are really bad. Um, but yeah, uh, all right. So uh, next, we're going on. Thank you for being willing to put a guess out there, Chase. Um, really appreciate everyone who's willing to participate. So uh, the mitochondrial disorders are next. So what do my mitochondria do? They provide energy or ATP. So um, Along with that, uh, there are some systemic findings. Um, anyone have any guess, like if you don't have enough ATP, what might happen? Uh, or for your eye, kind of what might happen. So ATP provides energy without it, like your muscles really don't work too well. So uh, you might have weakness. They also have hearing loss. Um, I think the maybe the yours pro take a lot of energy just like the retina does. And then classic on pathology is like ragged red fibers. And then with the eyes, like the key muscles are the ones that lift the eyelids and the ones that move, move the eyes around. So they get chronic progressive external apothelmal plegia, which is where like you get progressive ptosis, like the eyelids are drooping and then the, uh, they have, they can't like move their eyes to the side. So, um, those are the characteristic things. Um, anyone uh, other than Nana uh, know any names for these? Okay, well, uh, so there's Kern Sayer. I think that's like the most like well-known um, of these. Um, what's like a really important thing to know about like with Kern Sayer in terms of like their survivability? They're like on cardiac abnormality, like they don't they get yeah. like heart block. Yes, they get heart block. Very good. And then the other two are like kind of easy to remember because like they have like their their name basically describes what's happening. So um there's mitochondrial encephalopathy. 
So the brain's like not working too well. And then lactic acidosis, because the muscles are not getting ATP, so they're requiring lactic acid to work, and then stroke, and then maternally inherited diabetes and deafness. Okay, you guys are doing great. Really, the, the uh, retinal degenerations are like the biggest block of them, and uh, you have survived thus far. So <laughs> thank you. So this um, kiddo ended up having Zeltweger spectrum disorder. Um, it kind of was difficult to tell the parents that, you know, she probably will be like severely disabled. And depending on where she falls in that spectrum, she may progressively like lose her, um, her uh, functioning and potentially even like die in her teens or her 20s. So um, uh, Emily Spoth, our genetic counselor, felt that like with her um, presenting late, you know, not being diagnosed late, until late that, you know, that was like a good prognostic factor, but also like, you know, her, she had not had genetic testing due to like family not following up and maybe she could have been diagnosed like many, a few years earlier at least. Okay, does she have the characteristic face? Yeah, she, her, I'm not sure what the characteristic face is for Zellweger uh, spectrum disorders, but it definitely wasn't uh, typical hypertelior. Oh yeah, she had hypertelorism. You know so much, Nana. You're really impressing me. <laughs> okay, med students. Once you get once you get to this point in in a uh, in a uh, residency, you'll know as much as Nana. I'm looking test. forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So in a large forehead. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd say that. Okay, so we did retinal degenerations, the other phenotypes, fundus hypopigmentation, cherry red spot and vessel tortuosity, and myopia and retinal detachment. Excellent, we're making good progress. So this is a five month old who uh, got just brought to the ophthalmology clinic because he wasn't tracking. Uh, I don't know why, but we weren't able to <laughs> export the photos th that day. So you can see me and Glenn <laughs> hovering over in the reflection of the screen, taking a picture here. Um, uh, who ha Chase, do you know what this finding is called? Where uh, this part is like kind of white around the fovea and then the middle is, is darker. Going off of what the categorization was, maybe cherry yeah, red spot. Yeah. yeah, cherry red spot. Yeah, very good, excellent. So uh, this area looks kind of like red because the area around it is all white and you can't see the, chor the choroid below like normally you can see the choroid through the retina so and it, the choroid's kind of reddish it's got a lot of blood in it um what other conditions can cause a cherry red spot other than the inherited disorders affecting the retina and the rest of the body area uh, george oh yes yes Brianna, way to go yes so a retinal artery occlusion so um with the retinal artery occlusion, like uh, because the retinal arteries supply the inner part of the retina, uh, whereas the choroid supplies the outer part of the retina, um, when you uh, have like ischemia of the retinal arteries, then the inner retina tends to be like what swells and turns white. Um, and then you get this cherry red spot appearance too, because in the fovea, there's not that much inner retina. So you can see the uh, foveal pit pretty well. Okay, excellent. So, um, and then uh, what can we tell already about this child's prognosis prior to like getting any additional testing? Uh, this patient's doctor, Dr. Jardine was already like trying to mentally like prepare the parents for, you know, what the diagnosis might be. Um, so we can all already tell that they're probably going to fall into that neurodegeneration and early death um, category. So, all right. Um, glad Dr. Jardine had that conversation, not me. So, um, so some gross generalizations again, recessive is definitely the way to go. Um, and for most of these, um, most likely, and then the neurological problems. So as we talked about when Nana brought up Fabry disease before, is that these are also lysosomal storage disorders, but, um, instead of, uh, having, um, a, buildup of like uh, glycosaminoglycans or steroids, um, 
it's a buildup of sphingolipids. So there's a sphingolipidosis, and then there's also the trinucleotide repeat disorders. Um, so the I think um, in med school you learn about these things. I've since forgotten a lot, but there's like cerebrosides, ganglicides, single myelin, but I think they uh, basically are a lot involved in the brain. So that's why you really get that neurodegeneration. Um, and so what are the diseases that cause cherry red spots? Neiman and pick. And Neiman then... pick. Tay-Sachs. Oh, Tay-Sachs, Tay yeah. good. One more. Can gauch? Oh, wait, no. Yep, yep. Okay. Gauchier's disease? Gau Gauchier's disease, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but... Um, so yes, very good. Excellent job. You guys are impressing me. Um, so gauche also causes like these peripheral white spots and the brain is really not too bad. And then what was the one disease that caused the retinal vessel tortuosity? Uh, that's a lysosomal storage disorder that Nana brought up previously. Uh, uh. It's Fabry disease. And what else does Fabry disease cause other than retinal vessel tortuosity? There's a problem with vessels elsewhere in the body. Are there like kidney issues? Uh, I'm not sure if they have kidney issues. Someone Google it and let me know. <laughs> but they get um, this uh, angiokeratoma corporis diffusum. So potentially like on OCAPs they might, or on boards, they might like show you a picture of the skin with these like red uh, elevated lesions. And uh, also corneal vertricillata um, is a classic finding. Um, what other like inherited disorders cause like um, elevated uh, skin things and eye things? Like what general category? Angiophycomatoses or sorry. Yeah, the yeah, the yeah. phacomatoses. So um the phacomatoses are another thing that like you are should spend a lot of time memorizing. They often affect the skin as well as the eyes and show up on tests like quite frequently because it's the kind of thing where, oh, like if I see a ERM in like a, a 12 year old, like this could be, um, uh, I'm kind of blanking. What is it called? <laughs> I'm totally blanking. Oh my goodness. What is it? Congenital hematoma of the retina and RP, but what is the disorder that it go, the phacoentosis that it goes along with? There's a type one and a type two. <laughs> okay. Yes, neurofibromatosis. Thank you. I was having a brain block. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there, you know, these are like frequently tested things. So all right, excellent. And then Fabry is one of those that's X-linked. So basically most of these disorders that we've been over so far are all, um, are all recessive, except for like, which one do we discuss that was X-linked? Hunter. Yeah, Hunter. Um, and yeah, I think that was the only one. So Hunter and Fabry, remember those there's different inheritance okay and then there's a trinucleotide re repeat disorders what is like an example of a trinucleotide repeat disorder that doesn't affect the eyes that like we all learn about in med school huntington huntington very good excellent yeah so what is the inheritance of huntington's and other trinucleotide repeat disorders Doesn't, doesn't it like get more likely to affect you at a younger age depending on like if your dad gave it to you or something like that like it's your father yeah, if, you're, if your parent uh yeah if your parent gave it to you like do you need two parents to have huntington's nor to have huntington's no okay so that makes it autosomal autosomal recessive right or dominant autosomal dominant, dominant. yeah so yeah, so just having like one parent pass uh, that, you know, CAG repeat on to you is enough to like have it. Um, so that's an autosomal dominant disorder. And then the ones that affect the eyes. Um, oh, I guess I only put one on here. <laughs> I decided to cut back. <laughs> There's only one on here. And it's a myotonic dystrophy. And it causes some like classic um, eye findings. 
like this pattern dystrophy and a, a Christmas tree cataract. And then it also causes um, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Do you guys remember where chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia came up previously in this lecture? Kern Sayers. Yeah, Kern Sayer, yeah. Sayers. And what kind of, and then what kind of uh, retina problem did Kern Sayer have? Like which class was that? Which category, which phenotype? It was a lysis. Sorry, no, it's mitochondria. Thank you. Yeah, it's a mitochondrial. And then what? What? What do the eyes? What do the retinas look like in in Kern Sayer? Uh, so they they look like retinitis pigmentosa because like basically everything that we went over prior to now was like a retinitis pigmentosa, retinal degeneration type of thing, rod cone problem. Um, so Kern Sayer had that plus the chronic progressive external uh, ophthalmoplegia. The other thing that myotonic dystrophy shares with that is um, heart block. And when these people try to like uh, with myotonic dystrophy, try to grab onto something, they have trouble like letting go. So that's a really like characteristic thing for this disorder. Okay, got you guys are doing really great. So uh, this kiddo got diagnosed with Tay-Sachs disease and eventually like, cause when you're, you're five months old, like it's hard to tell if someone's developmentally delayed, but eventually he got diagnosed with global developmental delay. And then he started having seizures and then um, the family decided to go with hospice and like avoid any life prolonging measures, but they're trying to do whatever they can to make his quality of life good. So that right now is just taking seizure medications. So. Okay. So we went through retinal degenerations and cherry red spots, slash vessel tortuosity. And next we just have fundus hypopigmentation and myopia plus RD. Um, so this is a 10 year old male with a history of nystagmus. His best corrected vision is 2100. Um, I would uh, love to have like a better case of this disease. So if any of you guys like come across one where the fundus photos were taken in like 2005 in black and white. I would <laughs> really appreciate that. So please uh, let me know. Um, and uh, I guess, George, what's abnormal on this, uh, on this uh, fundus autofluorescence here? Uh, I would say maybe it's missing like the typical like pigmentation that you would expect um yeah yeah normally in the fovea there's like this black spot uh yeah. because of the macular pigment blocking the lipofusion in the rpe from it's like absorbs it so it doesn't get you know captured by the camera so this person is like missing the normal Hypo autofluorescence of the fovea. Um, and then when you do an OCT, you can see that they have no fovea as well. So, uh, and you can kind of see when you look at this like photo of their eye that their eyes are very blue, their eyelashes are very white. And you can kind of see it like a red reflex through their iris, which is called iris transillumination. Um, Anyone want to say what they think this is? Ocular albinism. Yes, uh, this is albinism. Um, there is like ocular, which like only affects the eye, not the skin and hair, and then ocular cutaneous albinism. I'm thinking that based on this hair color and skin color, that this might be like a ocular cutaneous uh, albinism. Uh, okay, now to inheritance. So ocular and oculocutaneous albinism have like different inheritance. Um, so this is another case. Well, I guess, guess what the two inheritances are. What are the two options? What the two things have come up mostly so far? Autosomal recessive and X-linked. Yeah, autosomal recessive and X-linked. Um, I need to <laughs> look at the next page to see which one is which. Okay. Let's go to the next page. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let's go back. Well, we'll we'll go back to that. Okay. 
what are other causes of like fundus hypopigmentation? Um, there's allergial and then Wardenburg. Uh, so those are just uh, things to like keep in mind. Um, every ophthalmology resident gets uh, very familiar with allergial syndrome or, uh, because uh, they get like a million uh, inpatient consults because like some kid is having uh, what kind of problem and then they want you to look for what kind of problem in the eyes. Like posterior, is it posterior embryotoxin or something like that? Yeah, posterior embryotoxin. So what is posterior embryotoxin? Like a thickened decimate, I think. Uh, maybe one of you could not, could not could explain it better, but there's like this white line near the limbus. And I think it's, um, yeah, some issue with the corneal endothelium. But I think, isn't some layer like growing more anteriorly on the cornea than normal? I don't know. Waiting for Nana to <laughs> explain it. But, okay. And then, okay, does rep represent an anterior, a posterior protrusion of decimase. Okay, all right. So Nana and uh, George are on the same page there. So, um, and then anyone remember anything about Wardenburg? Um, so they have like a white forelock and they have like iris heterochromia. So their two irises are different colors. Okay, now we're gonna, and Horner's? No, <laughs> no. Okay, not just trying to talk, but not a, okay. Uh, they both have heterochromia. Oh, Allergial and Wardenburg? <laughs> okay. Wallenberg syndrome? Okay, I don't know what, where we're... Oh, oh. Uh, hmm. Okay, congenital Horners and Wardenburg bo both cause iris heterochromia. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. Now, now I know where you're coming from. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Okay. Really appreciate that. Okay. And then, uh, so uh, since I don't remember which disease is inherited, which way, we'll click on the fill in the blanks here. So the ocular um, albinism is X-linked and then the oculocutaneous is autosomal recessive. Um, and then there are other variants on albinism that like are frequently tested because um, they affect other parts of the body, Chediak Higashi and Her Hermansky Pudlock. So those are definitely worth memorizing. So what are the key eye findings of albinism in general? We talked about iris heterochromia, uh, foveal hypoplasia. Our patient had nystagmus. A lot of times these, because you know, their foveas are not well developed, you know, they don't fixate that wall so they have nystagmus. Um, anything else? Okay. Oh, and oh, the uh, the uh, visual evoked potential is asymmetric because they have like um, abnormal wiring um, of their uh, optic nerves. So and decreased visual acuity, usually the visu visu visual acuity is not normal. And then systemic findings of albinism, um, uh, what are the key two things that like occur systemically that uh, are both prominent in Chediak Higashi and Hermansky Pudlak? So like if you saw someone with albinism and you want to think about like, oh, do we need to worry about these other conditions? Should we get genetic testing for them? Like, um, lots, they're in lots of infection, yes. you know? Yeah. yeah, infection and bleeding. So uh, both these disorders are characterized by those. Um, and the P in Pudlock should help you remember that uh, Hermansky Pudlock also has platelets, pulmonary fibrosis, and is more common in Puerto Rico, but it can also occur in other countries. So. Oh, yes, okay, very good. Oh, a blonde fundus. That's something I didn't even put on there because it was like so obvious um, to me that I forgot to say. So when you... Uh, what we mean by a blonde fundus is like people that are, are like very like light skinned, um, their retinal pigment epithelium also tends to be really like um, lightly pigmented. So you can see their choroidal blood vessels really well. So like if we go back um, to this picture, 
it's like, wow, we can really see like every single blood vessel in their choroid versus this is like more of a normal fundus, not all, oh, I don't know, normal, but more typical fundus pigmentation where you, it's kind of hard to see the choroidal blood vessels. Um, I have to say, you know, as a, I did a med, med school in New Jersey um, and I didn't like do any away rotations uh, elsewhere. And uh, when I first came to Utah, like, and I was a intern, I like asked Trent Richards, my senior resident, I was like, what is wrong with this person's eye? Cause their eye inside their eye looked like this. And he was like, he looked and looked, he was like, he, he couldn't figure out like what was abnormal about the person's retina. But then eventually we just realized I'd never like seen a blonde, the inside of a blonde person's eye before. So since I'd done med school in New Jersey. So anyway, th if you are like just really lightly pigmented, like a lot of Utahns are, this can be normal. And sometimes the question comes up like, is this normal or is this like albinism? And that's where we just involve our experts like Erica Wirtz. So <laughs> I, I'm not an expert on that. Okay, let's, uh, we'll keep going here. Okay, um, so retinal detachments in adult. Oh yeah, we're on our last category. We're almost at the end. The end is in sight. Amazing, we do one more lecture though. <laughs> But I don't know, maybe we should skip it. Okay, myopia and retinal attachments. So this kid with thick glasses and retinal attachments. So this is like what retinal detachments often look like in adults. This is actually an adult retinal detachment. But I thought I would show you a picture of like a retinal detachment in a kid. She's a teenager. She's had really thick glasses since she was age four. So four is like a really atypical age for needing thick glasses. And she they figured out she needed glasses because she was like holding things really close when she was in preschool and she's never been quite 20 20 but uh, her optometrist said like you know what I can't get your vision to be any better than 2070 in the right eye and 21 25 in the left eye so um this uh right eye fundus picture on these like big circles these are actually like macro cysts in the retina I'll show you my drawing of it so basically she had like an inferior retinal detachment um, and, uh, she had these like big macro cysts. So when you have a retinal detachment for a long time, the retina just starts like falling apart from itself. And then it, it makes these macro cysts. She also had like a hole in attached retina. You can see uh, up here. Um, but basically she'd had like some little holes right over here. And then the fluid had like trickled down following Linkoff's rolls and just like kind of filled up her eye from the bottom to the top and then her vision just went down <clears throat> and then she's got a little subretinal fluid on her um, OCT scan. Uh, I just sigh because this eye did not do well. It was 2070 before I operated and now it's like hand motions with hypotony oil in the front of the eye, band keratopathy. Anyway, sigh. So, um, this eye, left eye did better. It used to be her worst eye, but now it's her better eye. Um, she had a chronic detachment and you can see these like weird pigmentary changes here. Um, those are like demarcation lines. So when the retinal detachment is there for a while, the retinal at the edge, the retinal pigment epithelium tends to like make some changes. It can be hypo or hyperpigmentation, hyperpigmented. And then eventually the retinal detachment might progress past it and make like a new line. But in this case, the retinal detachment had like progressed all the way to like here. So uh, all the way past those. And then she's got some like fibrotic bands, subretinal bands here. And then you can see that her macula is detached on the OCT shallowly. So when the when the detachments are shallow, um, you know, they can be compatible with like pr pretty reasonable vision, you know, like 2070. So um, that's just the example of like a chronic detachment, like in a kid. So they don't all look like that, but definitely the things that made me think, okay, there could be some syndrome going on was the fact that she's had glasses since she was age four and she has these detachments. Um, so I thought I would um, show you this video. I better share a different screen. So, can you see my YouTube? Yes. So you can see here, um, there's like this membrane um, in the vitreous. Um, and this is uh, one thing that they, 
you can see in stickler syndrome um, is that the stickler vitreous, I would say, um, it's not as like black and white as um, people make it out to be in terms of like optically empty, but in general, it sh it's abnormal. So it can have this membranous appearance. It can look like the vitreous of a um, 80 year old where instead of being like really like uniformly like scattering the light, it can have like dense, denser fibers and then uh, less dense areas. Um, let me go back to sharing my other screen. So her vitreous actually had that membranous appearance in both eyes. So then I was thinking, okay, likely to have what disease? Stickler. Yep, Stickler syndrome. Very good, excellent. So um, with uh, the, the myopia and retinal detachment disorders, they're gonna be an exception to our um, general rules for the inheritance for these disorders. Um, generally speaking, uh, these conditions that cause myopia and retinal detachment are problems with extracellular matrix proteins, structural proteins, for which having half the amount is not enough. It's not like an enzyme, like a lysosomal enzyme that causes, um, you know, a lysosomal storage disorder where having half of an enzyme is enough to do the job. You know, if you don't have enough bricks to build your house, you're going to have, if you have half the amount of bricks, the bricks, it's not going to work. So uh, what are, uh, other than Stickler syndrome, what are some other diseases that cause myopia and retinal detachment? Um, okay, Wagner syndrome, good. Okay, so uh, I did, I skipped Wagner um, and no block just in the name of like, let's get the most highly tested ones on here, but those are um, other uh, uh, diseases that cause like these same phenotypes. Um, and uh, what are the genes that cause Stickler syndrome? Um, there are the collagen genes, so like call 2 a one um, I don't, uh, and call 11 a one uh, I, I guess that's as far as I would go with like the memorizing of the genes that cause Stickler syndrome. Don't get too crazy. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so I also put Marfan syndrome and Wild Marchesani on here because these can cause myopia and retinal detachment as well. So, uh, but I would say that probably in Marfan syndrome, like the retinal detachment is not as prevalent as Stickler or as young. So, but if you see, yeah. Okay, and what it, what gene is mutated in Marfan syndrome? The FBN1 gene. Yes, very good. So, so FBN1, and that encodes fibrillin. Fibrillin, um, oh, so the collagens are major, are what make up the vitreous of the eye, and then the fibrillin uh, make up what part of the eye? That's kind of like a ligament that holds the lens in place. That when it's zonules. broken, the zonules, yes. So the fibrillin makes up the zonules. So that's why when um, you have Marfans, you might get ectopia lentis. So um, we have ectopia lentis. Um, we talked about stickler. Oh, and the other um, systemic findings for stickler um, are Pierre Robin, meaning like uh, well, I think this is something that the residents also get very familiar with, even though they've they've tried to shunt uh, all the uh, NICU consults to the uh, peds attendings. I think you still see them. So uh, what are the key, uh, what is Pierre Robin? So Pierre Robin is like when the like face is not developing properly. I forget what like the inciting, it's like a a constellation of things that all come together when like things are not developing well in the lower face together. So you get like um, a small jaw and then the, like the tongue sticks out. So that's like loss of ptosis, maxillary hypoplasia. No, that's the cheeks. But then the mid face is kind of flat because the cheeks don't develop that well um, either. And then you get like cleft lip and cleft palate. So many times like when there's babies in the NICU that have like, all those problems with their 
lower face, they they might have like problems breathing, problems feeding because of that small jaw. Um, that then they might console ophthalmology and ask us to retinoscope them to see if they have like the congenital myopia. But I, I wonder if these days they should just like genetically test them. I don't know. <laughs> it would be more high yield than retinoscoping them because you can have stickler syndrome without early onset high myopia. So. And then I think you guys know about Marfan syndrome and Wild Marchesani syndrome. So I'm not going to go into detail about the systemic findings there. Okay, we got to the end. You did amazing.